Professor Elaine Scarry from Harvard, author of Nuclear Monarchy. Thermonuclear Monarchy. Thermonuclear Monarchy. We haven't been pushing the books, but all our speakers. Have been. There's a quotation that I very much like from Gandhi that says, you can wake a man who's asleep, but you can't wake a man who's pretending to be asleep. And I don't know whether the American population is actually asleep or pretending to be asleep, but it is very hard to get people aware of this. And I think that Alan Roebuck's work on nuclear winter showing that if only one one hundredth of one percent of the current arsenal is used, um, billions of people will die within the first month, has been done a great deal to wake people up. Whoever actually um, looks at his research does begin to see the problem. We know from Hiroshima and Nagasaki that what the devastating physical effects are of even a small atomic weapon and the physicians for social responsibility and um, Alan Roebuck and his colleagues working on nuclear winter make it very clear that um, millions of people uh, in, the, in the world as well as uh, millions of uh, birds and animals and plants will be devastated um, if there should be even a small exchange of nuclear weapons. And my work is trying to show that in addition to this incredible physical injury, there's also a profound civic injury that has occurred by the existence of nuclear weapons. Um, Alan showed you the, the graph for 2014. This is the graph for 2015. It's almost the same. There are a few, there's a tiny number of uh, scheduled to be retired weapons that have been retired, but there are also ominous things coming up. Uh, China, for the first time, has uh, a, an accomplished uh, SSBM, nuclear submarine force, that's now on the ground for the first time. And as he said, uh, close to 94% of the weapons are owned by Russia, which is everything from the blackout on your left-hand side, and the United States, which is everything from the blackout on the right-hand side. Um, and we know that this has uh, put the Earth in peril, as the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has said for the last two years, where we've now got a three-minute warning uh, in which we can act and still have blue sky. The civic injury comes about from what is obvious, from what Iron and Alan have just said. There is no way to protect yourself against this arsenal. So it has eliminated from all human beings on Earth the right of self-defense. This may seem like a small point, but the right of self-defense is a right underlying every other right that we have. Um, and the right of self-defense is also at the foundation of the human capacity for governance. I should say here that in addition to eliminating the right of self-defense, it's eliminated, um, as Iris' talk made clear, has eliminated our capacity for mutual aid. There is no way to help each other if there are only 94 beds um, in, a, in a terrain that will include tens of thousands of um, burn injuries. Now, given the incredible, um, the incredible physical impact of these weapons, why would we even stop to talk about the fact to say, P.S., it's destroyed governance? Mm -hmm. I think there are three reasons why it's crucial to hold on to this. First is that this isn't a, uh, a, a, an additional effect. It's what we're looking at. When we look at this gigantic architecture that has no purpose other than annihilation, that is, that architecture of state weaponry does not exist for some other purpose that incidentally entails the possibility of annihilation. It exists in order to bring about that harm. Um, that has been brought about by jettisoning uh, various governmental components that, had they been followed, would have made nuclear weapons impossible. And I'll try in the short time I have to begin to uh, show you how that's true. Second of all, even if it were possible that we didn't have um, an exchange of nuclear weapons or a single use of nuclear weapons, um, and that's nearly impossible, as earlier speakers today have said, and as um, Max continually points out, the chances that this isn't going to happen are you know, close to zero, possibly zero. But even if it didn't happen, the desecration to civic society is already happening and is happening right now. The fact that people don't have any voice, don't have any right of self-defense, 
are seen as having a stature that would let them address the problem of their own uh, defense is uh, a terrible thing. And then third of all, for us, I think, in this room, this is most important, understanding that governance provides the tools for dismantling the nuclear arsenal is crucial just because it's among the things we have at our disposal for um, undoing the current situation that we have. Um, the, the various constitutional, national, and international legal instruments had to be put aside in order to have nuclear weapons because you can't have nuclear weapons and be following these laws. So we just jettisoned the laws. But if we bring back those laws, we can only bring them back by jettisoning the nuclear weapons. And so the, the, two, the fact that the two are mutually exclusive is a, a very important detail of them. Um, the fact that, that the human beings on Earth have lost the right of self-defense is shown by the fact that um, we don't even hear voices around the world uh, asking us to eliminate our huge um, arsenal. When I showed you that graph a moment ago and the huge number of weapons owned by the United States, you can see that when we hear about nuclear weapons in this country, we hear about Iran, which isn't on that graph, doesn't have nuclear weapons. Iraq doesn't have nuclear weapons. We hear about North Korea. It has under 10 nuclear weapons, um, whereas we have thousands of nuclear weapons. Um, and in 1995, 78 countries went to the International Court of Justice pleading with the court to declare nuclear weapons illegal um, and inciting all kinds of international covenants of our own country in a joint statement of the Department of Defense and Department of State argued that having nuclear weapons, threatening to using them, using them and using them first does not violate uh, St. Petersburg, Geneva, Hague, um, the conventions on the ozone layer, or any, any of the following. And yet that uh, court case, which went on for months, was not even reported in the United States, showing that once you lose the right of self-defense, you also, um, you also very much lose your, your own voice. The other way in which our kind of loss of civic stature is shown is in the fact that we've come to believe that you can't eliminate them. Um, and starting with our mayor and going through to Allen, we keep hearing that of course we can eliminate them. This isn't a hugely difficult problem like solving global warming. You just dismantle them. Um, and we know from the fact that um, there are so many countries that have these nuclear weapons free treaties. The whole southern hemisphere is blanketed by countries that have agreed to be nuclear weapons free. This map shows the countries in red that have nuclear weapons and those that are nuclear weapons free. And you can see that this is very much a north-south problem. Reports done in Scotland, where they had a recent referendum to separate from England, driven primarily by Scotland's wish to get its four Trident submarines out of the Clyde River. Out of the Clyde River. They, those um, people made a study of how long it would take and that our own military has said is an accurate study, showing that certain parts of it, such as the dismantling of the triggers, can be done in a matter of hours, and other parts of it can take months, but it would take, could all be done in between two to four years. It would take much more time for the United States since we have a much greater um, size uh, arsenal, but it certainly is a very doable thing. And the fact that we, so much of our population believes that you can't do anything is part of the infantilization of the population that has resulted from nuclear weapons. So the, the specific national uh, covenant that I talk about is our own constitution and the way in which, in the, with the invention of nuclear weapons, we've had to eliminate both the, the constitutional requirement for a con congressional declaration of war and the actual meaning of the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, whose true meaning is to say no matter how much injuring power you have, whether it's zero or a vast amount, you have to distribute it equally among your whole population um, in order to hold it within a civil frame. Both these provisions have been eliminated since the um, start of uh, the invention of atomic weapons. And just looking at the Congressional Declaration of War, and 
Um, the, since the invention of atomic weapons, we have not even had uh, an actual legitimate congressional declaration of war, even in the case of conventional war. And the reason for that is presidents think, look, as Nixon said, if I can go into the next room, pick up a telephone, and in 25 minutes, 70 million people will be dead. That's an accurate statement that Nixon made. If presidents think that, why do they think they have to get permission merely to invade Panama um, or Haiti? Um, so that, that the senior Bush in the first Gulf War said, um, said, I didn't have to get some old goat's permission in Congress in order to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And his son, the younger George Bush, said in his State of the Union, uh, address in 2004, I pledge that I will never stop and get a permission slip um, in order to defend this country. Well, that permission slip is crucial because it means you are not, um, as, a, as a population, permitted to injure other populations until you have tested it, until you have put it through two incredibly diff difficult procedural gates. Um, and in, in, in a way that I can talk about at some point when we have more time, um, if you look very closely at the, um, at the, the um, deliberations for nuclear, uh, for, for a conventional war that we've had in this country, in the five cases where we've had a declaration of war, which is the War of 1846, uh, 1812, the War of 1846, the Spanish-American War in 1898 and World War I and World War II, and you compare it with the non-deliberation that occurs when our presidents have contemplated using nuclear weapons. And that includes Eisenhower, who contemplated using them in the 1954 Taiwan Straits Crisis. Uh, Eisenhower again contemplated using them in 1959 in Berlin. Um, Kennedy, we know from, um, John, from uh, Robert McNamara, Three times, not once, as we think about in Cuba, three times came within a hair's breadth of all-out nuclear war. That's quoting Robert McNamara. Lyndon Johnson considered using them to prevent China from getting nuclear weapons. Um, Nixon said he considered using them four times. And considering doesn't mean a stray thought. Nixon, for example, said, sent 18 B-52s loaded with nuclear weapons um, over Russia towards Vietnam. Um, and the record stops there only because, whereas in the case of congressional deliberation, it's all open uh, and known to the public, in the case of uh, presidential consideration of using nuclear weapons, it's as Alan said at the end of his talk, completely secret. Uh, he should be talking to uh, Alan Roebuck. We as a population ought to be able to demand they talk to uh, Alan Roebuck. But uh, the, the secrecy of it prevents that. Most important, and I'll just stop there, um, is the fact that in the uh, presidential deliberation about using uh, nuclear weapons that I look at in some detail in the book, Thermonuclear Monarchy, there's no dissent. No one raises any kind of testing of whether the proposition that this population deserves this is true. So thank you.